Hey there, I'm Dr. Barbara Woods, and today we are going to talk about building connection and family resilience as the fourth step in the intergenerational resilience method. So I am going to share my screen and we'll get started with the slides. Okay, so here we are. So a brief review of the intergenerational resilience method. This is basically a collection of interventions that are organized to create an efficient and effective system that addresses the impacts of intergenerational trauma across several generations. So we want it to be efficient because the family system, when you're dealing with intergenerational trauma, is quite complex and can be you can have a lot of moving pieces. So we want it to be very efficient in addressing these difficulties um, in a consistent way as well. And we want it to be effective because a lot of the families that have been impacted by intergenerational trauma really have had a lot of disempowerment where things don't work, they're really struggling, but they really want to do better um, so it needs to be effective and they need to see progress relatively quickly to help boost their engagement, their commitment, and give them some hope. So we'll review the method just a little bit. It consists of first improving regulation of the autonomic nervous system. So that's the fight, flight, and freeze responses. It's increasing earned secure attachment and earned secure attachment is basically when a person has one of the more the anxious avoidant or disorganized attachment strategies that are primary in relationships and you move more towards secure attachment strategies and it clears up some of these difficulties related with attachment disruptions that's kind of earned secure. So they've earned that security, but they've had disruptions to attachment in the past. Third pillar is to support the child's development and also to look back at the parent's development and address any of the impacts that they may have experienced when they were a child and experienced intergenerational trauma themselves. Fourth is building connection and resilience within the family system. So let's look at, if we skip any of these steps, we miss out on huge parts. So if we improve regulation and attachment, it's amazing. Those are two of the most important foundational pieces, but we won't go back and kind of address those developmental impacts and we won't build that family connection. And those developmental impacts can be very disruptive to the child's life, to the family system, to the parent-child relationship. If we only work on earned secure attachment and support development, we're gonna be missing regulation and connection. And if we're missing regulation, that's really the foundation of all of this, that if, if a person is highly dysregulated, defensive, shut down, this whole system will kind of fall apart. So that's regulation is like the ultimate foundation of this approach and of addressing the intergenerational trauma. And they won't have the connection between their family members and to the family members in previous generations. If we build connection and resilience and support child development and address the parents' developmental impacts, we're going to be missing regulation and attachment, and that's it's just not going to be effective at all. If we build connection and resilience and improve regulation, we're missing that piece of attachment in addressing the developmental impacts, which are huge. So we need all four of these pieces. So this is step four. The step four in a four-part series, series where we're looking at that intergenerational resilience method. So here we go. The goals of this step are to continue the focus and support towards attachment. We want to really make sure their attachment strategies can get to secure 
and that they are fairly strong and can stay there consistently. Um, we also want to increase positive family interactions. We want them to enjoy each other. We want to look in their family history for episodes or instances of resilience in previous generations. And that's so that we can integrate that ancestor's resilience so that they have a family history. There's a narrative that makes sense. And we really want to honor and celebrate their progress. So we're going to continue to support attachment because there's such significant attachment disruptions across generations that we really have to emphasize this and make sure those earned security, earned secure strategies are very solidly established. So when there's times of high stress and conflict, it's highly likely that that felt sense of safety is going to be kind of decreased or not, it's not going to feel safe. And attachment strategies may shift back towards anxious, avoidant, or disorganized. Um, and this, this is an adaptive response to something that's happening. So it's not a bad thing that these, these shifts happen because they're meant to generate and connect and um, maintain that attachment, but there's difficulties that can come along with them if they're used too consistently and become the dominant strategies that are used. So we want to maintain flexibility in that family nervous system where they can shift when they need to, but they return to that earned security and have that stability. So it's critical to support both the parent and the child um, for that earned security and relationships because that's what's going to give you the long-term success. So we want to increase these family interactions that are positive, that sustain the relationships in the family, because this is also what's important for maintaining long-term progress. So these interactions, it increases the connection between family members. They have good memories. They have fun together. And when possible and when it's healthy, it's also important to include extended family members in these interactions as well. So um, making sure that those connections across generations are also there. So some families benefit from having a developing kind of a routine for these positive interactions. So it can be like family dinners on a certain Saturday, Sunday, Friday, whenever it works for you, um, or family game nights where they order pizza or get takeout and um, play games as a family. Um, so this ensures the focus and the emphasis on building connection. And so the family game nights, I learned this through a family that was a foster family. And I worked with several of the kids that had gone through this house and they were at different points. They weren't always there when I had worked with them. But when I found out if they were ever placed in that home, I would ask, did you ever get to go to the family game nights? And they would light up, they would beam, they would gleam, they would be, it was such a positive memory. And every kid that I knew that went through that home had the same reaction. So it was just, it was such a positive experience. And when you, you're you dealing with intergenerational trauma, you need to have this as the glue that kind of holds these relationships together. We also want to assess the family history of resilience. So survival during traumatic experiences is adaptive and it needs to be recognized because without those survival strategies, the current generation wouldn't exist. They wouldn't have been able to come into this world. So it's really important to find those instances of resilience However, little caveat, maybe a big caveat, depending on the family you're working with, sometimes the survival strategies are considered negative or unhealthy. So that might be addiction, aggression, crime, those kinds of things. And like, we don't want to glorify them, but we need to reframe them in an attempt, an adaptive attempt at resilience, because they need to be identified and respectfully honored without repeating them in the current generations. 
so in the next slide, we're going to talk about a little bit about unconscious loyalty, which is when there's patterns in a family and one generation says, that's it. We're not doing this anymore. We're not going to have addiction. We're not going to um, be in conflict with people. And then all of a sudden it shows up again in a later generation because it wasn't integrated and resolved. So we don't want these patterns repeating, particularly the survival strategies that have parts of them that are negative and, health and unhealthy, although they help with survival. So another thing we want to identify this history of resilience because it gives a greater connection to that family history and helps provide a more integrated narrative when you understand your history and your family history in those previous generations, you can kind of integrate it and see it in, in your life and moving forward. We also want to integrate the ancestors' resilience because if, if there's intergenerational trauma, there is resilience and there's pockets of it in the ancestors. So we really want to see that after we identify it, we want to integrate some of these characteristics into the family's understanding of their history and family narrative. Um, so it honors the struggle of previous generations, what they've experienced, and increases the current generation, parent and child, the compassion for the experiences of these previous generations, as well as compassion for the current generation in themselves. If you look back and look at how many generations have had like disrupted attachment, there's no way somebody could all of a sudden learn attachment strategies without some kind of intervention and help and support. So we want to be able to, to kind of put into context that the reason our family was impacted is because of these previous things that happened. And that's okay. They made it through and we're going to move forward and honor them in some way that helps us with our family narrative and helps us have compassion for them and for our own circumstances and situation. So with the survival skills that have those negative impacts, addiction, um, aggression, all those kinds of things, we need to honor those that their sacrifices that were made, their survival strategies, we do not want to glorify them. So we don't want to yeah, this family, we're all about addiction and we're all going to be, um, we're all into that. So we don't want to identify with and integrate those negative coping skills that have negative life outcomes, but we want to respect and have compassion for the previous generations that struggled with those. It's also important to identify the patterns in the current generation to shift generational enactment or that unconscious loyalty. So again, that is where you'll have patterns in, in a family in previous generations. And all of a sudden, one of those things, maybe incarceration, addiction, um, aggression, or anger, like it's in a couple people in the, in the previous generations, and then it will show up in the current generation. And that's when those issues aren't worked through in the family system and given respectful space and having compassion for those people in your family, they'll keep those patterns keep repeating. So this is where we really want to recognize that without glorifying the negative. And then the last step we want to honor and celebrate progress. Like these families have had generations of trauma that are so difficult it's hard to recognize their progress. It's hard to do that. But, but this is a huge thing that in one generation, they may have turned the tide for the, the, all the rest of the generation. So we really need to recognize that progress and we need to honor that journey. So through the work that they've done in therapy, they will have created new possibilities for the generations to come. And it's really important to celebrate this and incorporate this kind of celebration into their lives and their daily living and maybe 
those family nights that they have positive activities together, it'll help sustain their progress. So now we're going to switch and we're going to look at seven steps to build family resilience. Now that with this video, there's two handouts um, that will be posted in the Facebook group. And um, if you want them and you don't see them, just DM me and I can send them to you. Um, and this is a handout that you can actually use with clients. And we're going to go through the summary of what is in that. So these are positive psychology tools of gratitude, optimism, all those kinds of things that are like the positive um, coping skills and positive psychology tools. Word of caution, when you're working with trauma and especially intergenerational trauma, we have to be kind of careful with positive psychology tools because if somebody's in the midst of multiple generations of trauma, attachment disruptions, and you tell them, well, let's work on some optimism, that is not going to go well. So this, these strategies really need to come towards the end of therapy to build those positive psychology tools and, and coping methods into the family after the trauma has been addressed. So the first one is gratitude. So like being grateful for little things can pull brains out of kind of that old complaining or dissatisfied mode. And the experience of gratitude builds those alternative networks in the brain. So we're kind of moving away from trauma-based thinking to more growth and resilience-based thinking. So during a right nighttime routine, parents can review these events with the child the day and what they are grateful for and what kind of has happened through the day that has caused them to feel good. Um, so they can discuss this in depth. They can kind of really build on what they are thankful for that day. And um, you could also remark as the parent, you could have the parent remark on what they did, the child did that day to help you feel grateful. So that will build the connection in the relationship. Playfulness is extremely important it, because it's surprising how many kids, they have no adults to play with. I had a little person give me a toonie, which is a $2 coin as a tip because I'm the only adult that this little person knows that it likes to play and plays nice and just really appreciated that. So um, it's really important for adults to learn how to engage in play with kids because that's their language. It's the main way that they process conflicts, that they solve problems. And you can't go wrong if you play with them. Being silly builds that window of tolerance. Being adventurous and connected during the play helps the parent-child relationship, helps support the development of social skills. Play is a mixed autonomic state between sympathetic and social engagement. So it's kind of riding the edge of the window of tolerance, which is that's how you expand that and have greater capacity to deal with stress and have a greater range of responses when you do experience a stressor. Mindfulness, so this helps us to stop hijacking the brain. So staying present in the moment with a child makes a huge difference in the parenting and the relationships. There's a whole intervention package that is based on mindful parenting because it slows down when something happens <clears throat> and when the parent reacts. So it gives you more time be between stimulus and response, um, and it gives you more range of coping because you're going to stay a little more regulated. So practicing just small one-minute exercises will help build a foundation of mindful living when they're done with the kids. They reduce stress. They promote self-awareness, self-regulation. So it's time to stop and smell the roses. <clears throat> Working on acceptance. So parents are under huge pressure to make sure they're doing everything just right for the child. There's so many different types of parenting and parenting recommendations that it gets really overwhelming for parents. And then they have all their time pressures and busy schedules on top of that. 
So sometimes families or parents mainly get caught up in what we think we should be and we lose out on the beauty of what is. So allowing whatever is happening, even if it's a tantrum, to just be without fixing it, changing it, or controlling it. So this is a real key for tantrums because what's happening is the child's nervous system is dysregulated. They likely don't feel seen, heard, understood. There's not a felt sense of safety. That if we try to go in right away, fix it, change it, control it, consequence it, um, then it's going to make the tantrum worse. So if we can just be present, stay focused, use that mindfulness, um, it'll have it'll give the parent a new sense of freedom where there's not a lot of pressure to address and control and contain a tantrum, and then can, like have to keep doing that, and it grows worse and worse because that strategy usually doesn't work. Um, and it takes the pressure off both the parent and child. So it will build that relationship. So that isn't to say that, um, tantrums are, we want to encourage them or, um, we don't want to do anything. We just, we want to accept it and not try to shift it or change it. And we want to shift it and change it when the child is later regulated and has that felt sense of safety back. Optimism. So this is part of positive thinking. It rewires parts of the brain, reduces complaining. So if we help kids see the brighter side of things, and it helps them develop a greater ability to cope with stress. So it may be best learned when the child is in a neutral or positive state of mind. So we don't want to do this in a tantrum when they're or when they're dysregulated, when they're kind of clingy, agitated, tired, um, because it, it's not going to, it's going to be very difficult for them to shift into being optimistic. So it's better to practice this one when they're either in a neutral state of mind or they're positive. So if the child is in a, the middle of a tantrum, it's better to be optimistic when reviewing the situation after that tantrum storm is over. Kindness is very important in families for with intergenerational trauma because th there can be a lot of unkindness, a lot of anger, a lot of frustration within the family with each other and with the supports agencies schools, those kinds of things that that they're involved in, because typically these the families end up um, having difficulties at school or end up involved in agencies like child welfare, where it can be a very unkind process. So it's really important to help build in some kind of kindness, and especially between siblings, so there can be greater bonds in relationships. It helps them develop positive social skills, helps them develop a sense of belonging. So little acts of kindness go a huge, long way when life is stressful. So you could have families write simple acts of kindness on small pieces of paper, put them in a jar, pick a card to work on through the week and practice those kindness skills in that both home and school. The last top strategy is empathy or compassion. So supporting the child in identifying and understanding other people's emotions helps build their social skills, help them in social perception, and it also improves their own self-regulation. So throughout the day, you can look for various expressions of emotion that you can discuss. Um, you can look at like what that feeling might be if they're happy, sad, um, mad, scared, what may have caused that emotion or feeling, and what could happen to help that person feel better. So those are the seven top strategies for family resilience. And in summary, when we increase the connection between family members, this is so important for maintaining progress over time. So the stronger... <clears throat> family relationships grow, um, they help create greater resilience. So there's kind of a synergistic effect between 
um, family relationships, resilience, regulation, all of that. It just, it really gives the synergistic effect that everything kind of expands and grows. And that's for each family member individually and the family overall. And when we're able to honor their ancestors' journeys, when there's intergenerational pre trauma present, this is critical to integrate that family history in a healthy way that promotes growth and resilience. So the integration of these ancestors' experiences helps create a sense of pride and compassion for the sacrifices and courage that they may have demonstrated in the past. So that is it for the slideshow. I'm going to go back to comments and... Here's my friend Muhammad. He's wanting this file. I will send that to you through messages. We, we Muhammad and I message quite a bit, so um, I will send that to you in a few minutes after this presentation. So I hope you are having a wonderful day, and I will see you later.